Hello everybody. I'd like to talk about the spinal nerves and roots and rami that emanate out from the spinal cord today. So remember that while the spinal cord itself is part of the central nervous system, everything out here that you see in yellow is part of the peripheral nervous system. Even though it touches the spinal cord, it still is the peripheral nervous system. So right here, we see our roots. We have the posterior root right here, and I can easily identify that because of the posterior root ganglion, this bulge, this location of cell bodies right here. And then this one right here would be the anterior root. Remember that anterior and ventral mean the same thing in humans, the same direction, as well as dorsal and posterior. So sometimes you may see this labeled as the dorsal root or the posterior root. Remember that sensory and motor information are separated at the roots. So sensory information goes into the spinal cord through the dorsal root only, and motor information is carried out of the spinal cord through the ventral or anterior root. So sensory information and motor information are separated. However, when you get to this area right here, which is the spinal nerve, the place where the posterior and anterior roots join together, uh, these are mixed, so you can carry both sensory and motor information when you're out here in the spinal nerve. Same as you move out to these structures, the rami. Um, here is your ventral or anterior ramus for the spinal nerve, and then here is your dorsal or posterior ramus. And these may also be mixed, but it's just as you get closer to the spinal cord, these roots right here, the roots are very specific. The dorsal root or posterior root carries sensory information only, while the ventral or anterior root carries motor information only. But when you get out to the spinal nerve and farther out, then you may have mixed nerves that carry both sensory and motor information. This is the ventral or anterior ramus, and the anterior rami of multiple spinal nerves may come together to form what's called a plexus. Uh, and it's easy to get these confused, uh, the ramus versus the roots. But just remember that the roots have separate information. You have motor versus sensory information that are separated in the roots. The roots are closer to the spinal cord. Farther out from the spinal cord, past the spinal nerve, the rami may be mixed. They may carry sensory and motor information. Dermatomes are the sections of skin that are supplied by spinal nerves. And you can see each of the spinal nerves are labeled on this picture. And each of those supplies that particular strip of skin that they are associated with. Um, so you can see on the front and the back, each spinal nerve innervates um, and detect sensation from a particular area of skin. This is useful when we look at some diseases such as shingles. Uh, you have a particular strip of skin that's affected and then you can consult a map and of the body where your dermatomes are and you can determine which of those spinal nerves has been infected with a virus that's been hanging out and now it's flaring up again. Nerve plexuses also emanate out from the spinal nerves, in particular, the ventral or the anterior rami of the spinal nerve. So the posterior side doesn't participate. It's just the anterior side, the anterior rami. And remember, I'm talking about the ramus, not the root. So we're farther out from the spinal cord. Uh, and so you have several different nerve plexuses, which are just networks of these rami from the spinal nerves. So for example, the cervical plexus, uh, cervical because it's located in the neck, it is formed by the anterior or ventral rami from spinal nerve C1 through C5. And you can see the ventral or the anterior rami are all forming this kind of network right here. So this is your plexus, your cervical plexus. Uh, and for my class in particular, I want you to know one of the nerves that emanates out of this plexus, and that is the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve innervates the diaphragm, and uh, as it innervates your diaphragm, it causes that diaphragm to contract and causes you to breathe. So the phrenic nerve is involved in breathing um, through innervation of the diaphragm. And sometimes if it gets irritated, 
then uh, such as can happen if you have heartburn, the esophagus, you have a little bit of acid reflux coming back up. It can irritate the phrenic nerve and that can cause hiccups. For example, one cause of hiccups. Other causes are unknown. The brachial plexus is also relatively high up in the neck. So it's formed by the anterior rami of spinal nerve C5 through C8 and then also T1. So you get just a little bit into the thoracic spinal nerves. Uh, and this plexus is responsible for innervating the shoulders and the upper limbs. Now remember these nerves are mixed. So they may carry sensory information into the spinal cord and they may also carry motor information out to specific muscles. There are some specific nerves that I want you to know uh, and those are listed here. We'll talk about those individually, but you can see here's where your original root is. Uh, and then as you follow those out, you can see there's a lot of transfer, some merging, some splitting. Um, so you can see that it's very easy for these nerves to be mixed with all this back and forth. And then you can see these five nerves, five of the main nerves coming out of the brachial plexus here. There are quite a few more, but these are the ones that we're going to focus on for now. And you can see these nerves go all the way down the arm. So these are some pretty large nerves. The axillary nerve um, innervates the deltoid and the teres minor muscles. And then if you get sensation on the skin of the so shoulder, then the axillary nerve will carry that back to the, um, back into the spinal cord. The musculocutaneous nerve uh, is responsible for innervating your, uh, some of the muscles of your upper arm, in particular the biceps brachii, brachialis, and coracobrachialis, and it detects sensation from the skin on your lateral forearm and your elbow. I know, the muscular and the cutaneous don't quite line up, but that's how the dermatomes go, right? It depends on where that skin is that that uh, spinal nerve innervates. The radial nerve innervates the posterior muscles of your arm and your forearm. So uh, your triceps, for example, your extensor muscles of your forearm. Uh, and it, inter it detects sensation from the skin on the posterior lateral surface of your limb. The median nerve is involved with innervating the flexor group on your anterior forearm. So um, flexor carpi radialis, for example the intrinsic muscles of your lateral palm and digital branches. It detects sensation of the lateral hand on the ventral side, that skin. This is the nerve that is involved in the pincer grasp. So if you um, try to make your hands look kind of like a crab or a lobster grabbing something, the median nerve is involved in that. Uh, and this is also the nerve that is compressed in carpal tunnel syndrome. It runs right underneath, there's a, a retinaculum, a, a fibrous band that runs around your wrist. And when you have inflammation, as what you see in carpal tunnel, it can compress that median nerve and cause pain also make it difficult to, um, to move your fingers. You saw that the, the digital branches, so fingers, uh, your finger muscles are impaired if you have damage to your median nerve. The ulnar nerve is responsible also for uh, some of the flexor muscles on the anterior forearm and some of the muscles of the hand. It detects sensation from the skin of the medial side of your hand. Uh, and if you hit your funny bone, it is actually the ulnar nerve right where it rests at the medial epicondyle of your humerus. And you can kind of feel that bump on the inside of your elbow. And there's just a little kind of a divot there right where your ulnar nerve passes by. And if you bang that on something hard, then I don't know why they call it a funny bone because it sure hurts. The lumbar plexus is formed by the anterior rami of L1 through L4. Uh, and you can see that plexus right here. You can see this one isn't quite as scary as the lumbar, as the uh, brachial plexus. There's not quite as much going on. Over here on the right, you can see pictures uh, of some of the nerves innervating out of both the lumbar and the sacral plexus. So you can see some of the nerves from the lumbar plexus in orange right here. Uh, so you can see the femoral nerve. And then you have the sciatic nerve coming over here, which is the largest nerve in the body. But this one is actually from the sacral plexus, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Two of the nerves that emanate out of the lumbar plexus are the femoral and obturator nerves. 
The femoral nerve serves the anterior muscles of the, of the thigh, so your quadriceps, for example, uh, and it detects uh, cutaneous sensation from the skin of your anterior and medial thigh. Your obturator nerve is responsible for innervating your uh, adductor group uh, as well as your gracilis. And then the cutaneous sensation that it senses is from the skin of the medial thigh and also your hip and knee joints. The sacral plexus is located just a little ways uh, inferior to the lumbar plexus. It's formed by the anterior rami of L4 to L5 and also S1 to S4. So you can see those nerves and how they interact with each other here in this picture. Uh, the sacral, sorry, the sciatic nerve is actually created by the combination of two different nerves. So these start off as two separate nerves. You have the common fibular nerve here and then you have the tibial nerve here, and then they join together to make this sciatic nerve, which is a very large nerve. The sciatic nerve innervates the muscles of the back of the thigh, the leg and the foot, so your hamstring muscles, for example, uh, and it detects cutaneous sensation from the skin of your leg. If you have sciatica, which is a common disorder, this is when you have stabbing pain in the sciatic nerve. And if you transect this nerve, so if you cut it, the leg is completely useless. I was in a, um, a, a defense class one time, and one of the things that they taught us is if you're able, if the opportunity presents itself, and if you're able to hit the back of the leg, like around where the hamstrings are really hard, and you can get that sciatic nerve, that person will be unable to walk for a little while because you have temporarily caused pain to the, the sciatic nerve and it just won't work. It won't innervate your hamstrings and your hamstrings are used for extension of your leg so you can stand on it. So I would imagine it would be kind of hard to get all the way back to the sciatic nerve, but just if the opportunity presents itself, it can be useful. The last plexus is a pretty small one. It's the coccygeal plexus uh, and it's only formed by the anterior rami of S4 to S5, and then the coccygeal nerves. And it really just supplies a small area of skin in the coccygeal region. The coccygeal plexus also innervates some of the muscles of the perineum through the pudendal nerve. 